Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to uh, Vintage Motocross Radio. I'm your host, Joe Abadi. This is our premiere episode. We're very excited uh, to be here today, and hopefully we'll be here each Sunday from this day forward at 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, bringing you some interviews and some really interesting people to speak to. My first guest today uh, held the dubious distinction of holding a license in motorcycle racing in so many different disciplines. It's unbelievable. Uh, Score, off-road, supercross, FIM, Grand Prix motocross, AMA dirt track, AMA motocross, and speedway. And at some point, he held all of these licenses all at the same time. I'd like you to welcome my first guest, Warren Reed. How you doing? Warren, are you there? you're there, obviously. Yeah. All right, Warren, it's uh, great to have you here with us. And did I cover just about every discipline of motorcycle ride you've been involved in, or did I miss any? Uh, well, I never held a license, but I did uh, compete in a trials event one time. That ah. was, uh, it didn't come out very well. <laughs> no, you just didn't uh, just didn't deal with the trials very well. No, I was trying motocross between the sections and went over the bars, and so that kind of <laughs> ruined the day. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, let's um, let's get right down to it, Warren, and we're going to begin at the beginning, as they say. Um, you were 11 years old when you got your first bike, and I understand it was a very special experience. Why don't you take a few minutes and tell us about that first bike you got? Well, it was, uh, you know, when uh, I was always a, a Stingray bicycle kid, mm -hmm. and I just, you know, riding around everywhere and doing jumps, just it, it just naturally occurred. You know, every, everybody just kind of did it at, in those days. And then, um, you know, one kid showed up, you know, in the field with a mini bike and, and it kind of changed for everybody. And then the only reason from that point when you rode, rode a bicycle was just because, so you could practice for when you got, you know, a mini bike or sure. something. And, um, you know, my, my parents had, had divorced and my dad had bought a used taco 66 mini bike from somebody and, and stuck a Tecumseh engine in it. And, uh, and, and I got that, uh, he got that for me and my brother for Christmas. He fixed it up and it was kind of our Christmas present. And then, uh, and then uh, a few months later, the you know the my dad moved back east. It was you know the kind of a, a troubled time, very you know for everybody, family, him, and my mom, and everybody. And, and uh, so the mini bike just kind of sat for a long time, but the bicycles didn't. Anyway, the uh, uh, but my dream was always the same, and uh, you know it was to race motorcycles and bicycles were everything. Anyway. Uh, still kept close and in touch with my dad we're, we're, we always were very close he, he passed away about uh 18 years ago now but we were always close even with the split but he told me if, if i saved up my money that he could he would pay half and so i saved my money and my at, at that time uh, my mom uh was dating a guy that that rode bikes and uh we had been um going to the Ascot half miles and TTs, you know, for, you know, that was our fun. You know, I, I competed in swimming at that time and didn't do any other team sports, but was a very, uh, involved, um, competitive swimmer and diver. Mm -hmm. And then once I saved the money and, and, uh, the, the guy that my mom was dating, a guy named Ed Penfold, who still owns a company called Versafab in Gardena, California, by the way. Wow. And, um, and makes a lot of parts for motorcycle companies, everybody else. But anyway, he had a contact contact at Yamaha and they sold him a bike and, uh, used to pay for it. And, and then his younger brother also got one. And, uh, that was, uh, you know, that was my life just changed. And, was, and those and, were, those were Yamaha JT ones worn. Yeah, the Mini Enduro, the 60, remember the red, you know, they had the red tank. With I do. The white stripe and the white fenders with the red stripe. And uh, I do. And if you were about 10 or 11 years old during that time, that was uh, that was the bike of your dreams, really. Oh, it was. And and, and I, was, I was so lucky in that my mom, uh, about that time, um, you know, saw how much I loved it. And, and swimming really wasn't in the future. My, my little brother also liked it. He was a bicycle guy, just like me, all my friends in the neighborhood we we're all bicycle guys and mini bike guys or whatever and lots of people in, in the neighborhoods wrote you know rode dirt bikes and everything uh, um there was a, a lady that lived a couple streets over named sammy dunn and if you ever look at the people that climbed the matterhorn at saddleback park on a 650 rickman 
She did. So wow. you see the name Sammy Dunn on the Matterhorn hill climb. Uh, that's that's a woman, and she lived around the corner, and she'd go through the gears on a wheelie on that thing down the street, and uh, she had blonde hair, and anyway, that was amazing. That is. <laughs> for, for a 13-year-old boy. Yeah, I bet <laughs> Every it was. Every other 13-year-old boy in the neighborhood. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, but my mom, you know, sold her Carmen Gale, bought a Dotson pickup truck, bought a, you know, a Yamaha 175. My, my brother got a little mini bike, and that's what we would do for fun on the weekends. And, of course, we met people that, you know, friends of people that rode, and, and they had friends, and pretty soon you end up with, a you know, a group of, of common interest friends. Every weekend we'd go riding, and the, the family cabin up in Wrightwood was a, a central part of that. Wrightwood's in the mountains on the north of Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. and very close to the desert and so we did a lot of desert riding a lot of mountain riding and um i wanted to race in the worst way because i was a competitive swimmer you know when i, when I swam i never i didn't swim for second place everything you know? was a race to you yeah <laughs> and uh even if, if it's a swim team it's still an individual sport you know like motocross yes and but i you know we just didn't have the money and um and, and i felt like i was fast enough and i really would ride a race here or there you know and i'd pedal my stingray to all the bicycle shops all around Orange County and I'd tell I'd sit on the bikes and I'd tell the salesman if you just sponsor me I can beat Jeff Ward you know I can beat you know Davey <laughs> Carlson I can beat you know no. <laughs> all, I can, I, just give me the bike you know give me a Steens with a 100 dollars knock I can beat those guys you yeah. know Stra and, um, strangely enough Warren I did read where when you were about 12 years old it seems like you really did have a knack for sponsorship it said that you had some type of sponsorship from a company or a little shop called Cyclepath Motors yeah, he, uh, a guy named Eric Kohler, who coincidentally only lived about six doors down from my now wife, Cinda. Oh. <laughs> and he lived, and he, anyway, he was a fireman, and uh, so he, he uh, him and his brother went in on a little, they bought a Foster's Freeze that went out of business, and they filled it up with Gemini mini bikes and a couple of other brands. And, it's, you know, and it's, the day after he opened, every kid for, you know, five miles knew about it. And, uh, you know, I rode my bicycle there the you know, the, the first chance I got, and, you know, I'm kind of standing there doing 13 year old BS session. <laughs> oh yeah, I race. <laughs> I'd ridden, I'd race like three times. You know, I race. Oh, you race. Yeah. And they, oh, I'm looking for somebody to, to, to race and kind of get some name for my shop. Oh yeah, I'll race. <laughs> and he did that for, and he did that for you at 12 years old and, uh, gave you yeah. a little help right there, huh? Yeah. He, well, he had a bike, you know, a couple of bikes. I think Jim and I helped him with some demo stuff to, to help get the name out. Sure. And, the um and so i think my my second race was the the the, the world mini bike championship and i entered the beginner class because i didn't know what i was supposed to race I entered beginner class and i won the first two motos by a mile <laughs> and then and um in the one to three horsepower class <laughs> and then the uh the third moto the the uh it was a brand new developed bike, and I guess the, the 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 paint they got paint inside the gas tank, and the gas melted it and it plugged up the filter, and so I ended up getting fourth, and I got beat by um, Pam Bennett. Uh, so Pinky Pam Pinky Bennett, yes. if you're out there, congratulations! And and uh, and Bobby Toko won the big race that day. I watched Bobby Toko um, uh, win that race. So that was uh, you know and and. and Butch Gilliland was one of his teammates, and his son David Gilliland is a NASCAR guy, and um, and the other guy was Jim, the other rider for Gemini at that time was Jim Tarantino. A lot of motocrossers remember Jim Tarantino. Yep. So, uh, of course, that's why I got to you know watch that day. But you know, right in the beginner class and watching those guys, um, I was ready. Well, we didn't get to race that much, you know, little races here and there, but I got to ride because of my mom. And the, the family group got to ride every weekend, uh, you know, for years, two or three years, you know, running. And uh, I think looking back, that's the biggest advantage I had over all the other guys that were racing mini bikes at the time or racing, you know, even local motocross. Because when we go out to the desert, the mountains, I'd ride all day Saturday, all day Sunday. And... And I'd push my bike to fields during the week. I had more seat time. By the time I finally got a real motocross bike, I had probably ten times the seat time of all the other guys. And and every time I got on the bike, it was a competition. Who else? Ever else was riding? That was my competitor. All I could think of was passing them and beating them. And it's the um, anyway. It it uh, worked out good, and it kind of leads to the, you know what 
how did I get into motocross? Well, we, we made motocross tracks ourselves, you know, in the fields and out in the desert. And, um, and you know, I, you know, I finally, I, I got myself an SL 125. I sold the mini and bureau and then, you know, paid, uh, got, got the SL 125. The guys at Honda were friends of ours, part of our riding group. So John Rosenstiel, Dennis Blanton, Roy Turner, those guys were all just happened to be part of our weekend riding group. And, you know, they all had 250 two stroke motocross bikes, and I had my SL 125, and I just wax them. Wow. Yeah. You know, Warren, you've, you've filled in so many blanks for me, and I'm sure for so many of the listeners too, because as, as much research as I did or, or followed your career or looked at different results, uh, it, it always it, it puzzled me how you went from it, it seemed like this JT1 or this SL 125, and next thing it you know, it seemed like you almost had a factory ride almost immediately at, at 14 years old, although it wasn't. You, you had the Dennis Blanton CR125, um, but it just seemed to happen so quick. Well, like I said, that, that was, you know, looking back, I think that was the, the two things that, that's, well, a few things set me up. One is, you know, when times were pretty tough there for a while, mm -hmm. but my, my mom, made sure that you know even even if the the yard wasn't the perfect landscaping we had many bikes that ran they weren't fast they weren't fancy they weren't anything she had a pickup truck to get them to the desert you know we we all we did everything as a family and friends all those weekends all that time yeah and and my, my competitive spirit had already been you know um cultivated and, and festered and you know through uh, swimming and everything and um that you know when once again once i got the chance you know what just give me a chance <laughs> it, it uh it took off and, and that when dennis and, i mean all those guys that we're riding with you know they saw it you know they were those guys saw the fastest guys in the world you know i was just some kid that was part of the riding group but there was a you know a lot of other kids but and i had i had fire early on and um then dennis and wendy uh blanton um and Dennis was Marty Tripes' mechanic for 73 for the Super Bowl, you know, his second Super Bowl win and yes. everything. And uh, he bought one of the very first CR125s that came in the country. You know, he worked for Honda and, and said, hey, Wendy and I want you to, we bought this and we want you to go race it. You know, and I was like, okay, <laughs> I'm ready. Sign me up. Well, here's the, here's the funny thing. I hadn't ever even been on a motocross track before that. I hadn't ever i'd seen one i'd watched it saddleback once but i hadn't been on one other than ones we made in the desert you know yes and um and so the first race was at ascot which is right around the corner from where honda was located so um my mom got off work early and my the first wednesday we drove to ascot park and um and to sign up and i had been to lots of half miles and dirt tracks and i used to catch crawdads in the ponds you know <laughs> when they'd open the pits after the you know, after the races were over, <laughs> I mean, I knew Ascot. I'd watched it plenty. Well, we go to sign up, and they, it's CMC. That's the biggest club on the planet. You know, Ascot had you know hundreds. You know, what three, four, five hundred riders. Yeah, you know, there was night. a lot of talent down there. Sure. And I, I went. Well, we went to sign up, and I was fourteen. I was four foot ten. I weighed ninety two pounds. I was a little kid. You know, I was really small, for even for fourteen. And she and Dennis said we. Uh, told my mom, you need to sign him up in intermediate. He's fast enough for intermediate, and the juniors are crazy. And uh, and they all said, uh, and, and we went to sign up, and all these guys are signed up. And Kelvin Franks, who was the uh, you know the uh, vice president to Stu Peters, mm -hmm. you know, he said, well, has he ever raced? And my mom said, no, <laughs> he never raced a motorcycle. Well, he can't ride intermediate. My mom said, well, his sponsor, and so and he says he's going to ride intermediate so all these guys are signing up and they're looking at this little kid and they all had to think i was 11 years old you know and, and we're going to ride 125 intermediate on a cr 125 and and they're just you could just you could see the look on their faces anyway she she finally wore him down he said okay he can race intermediate and if he doesn't you know um make it we'll move him back down well you remember this cmc that's the fastest club on the planet yes. 125s at that time and the most people so anyway they never asked me to move down how did you do that day? I I end up uh, I think I got sixth overall, so I almost won the third moto. I'd never even you know seen a starting gate before. Yeah. And in the third, and I, but I you know I, I 
did a couple starts and then I went and watched a bunch of starts in third third moto I whole shot by a mile because I figured out that if you back five feet off the gate and wait and when the guy got <laughs> two feet from pulling the lever you just dumped the clutch <laughs> you figured that out right away and I was gone yeah and, and I ended up uh but uh, I, I bumped with the guy right at the final turn and ended up uh, not winning the third moto but I still got I think I sixth overall and then the next week came out back for my second race and I whole shot the first moto and I won by by 10 seconds and uh and so that was that was june of 73 and in uh, uh early at 74 i made expert and by by rating my only race down at speedway 117 which is right across from the mexican border and ron and i was racing intermediate ron turner was the 125 pro down there and i, I beat him I was an intermediate, and that, that was my final points to make CMC Pro. That was early 74, and then April 75, I raced my first national at um, Hangtown and got fourth overall. It, and it's just it's amazing how quickly this all progressed and the sacrifice your mom made, too. And, you know, maybe getting a little sentimental here, I don't know. But from what I've researched and understand, it was your mom, Carol, who met her husband, John Rosenstiel, very famous Honda mechanic. I'm sure everybody's familiar with who he is. I mean, she met her future husband at a race because you had raced that day. Well, well, the, well, it was a little bit different. He was part of our weekend ride group at the cabin. Oh, he was, okay. He worked with Dennis Blanton, and um, and 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 he kind of came into the picture about the same time as Roy Turner. You guys all know Roy Turner, you know, Team Cow's Hockey mechanic, and yes, you know, aggressive suspension and and specialized, you know, you know, rock shocks and all that stuff. Well. Roy was a mechanic at uh, Pacific Coast Honda, and uh, Honda was and Honda Factory. You know, Dennis and and John R were part of our wedding group, and and they were looking for a mechanic for Richard Irstead when they hired Richard Irstead. Uh, I remember distinctly sitting in our cabin, and my mom goes, "Why, why don't you hire uh, Roy?" <laughs> hmm. So Roy Turner owes his motocross career to my mother putting in a good word for him to get a. Uh, <laughs> A job as a factory mechanic, and uh, but when 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 Dennis and uh, and Wendy sponsored me, you know, of course Roy and and, De- and John R were you know there, and and that right about that time is when my mom started dating uh, John R. But you know they you know, they were casual friends for a, for a long long time before they started uh, dating. I see. And, but after you know, and then so that was seventy three, then seventy four, uh, um, then. You know, my, John and my mom got married, and they bought the bike from the Blantons. And uh, and Blantons still remain friends. In fact, they live uh, only a few miles from me here in Georgia. And uh, you know that you know when you when you think back, you know how how lucky can a, a kid get that you know that uh, man you have all these desires and and you feel like you have this talent and um, and, and somebody you know sees it and you yeah. know and, and so you go go yeah. after you know and the stars the stars just line up for you and, in, in and, that and, in that time and uh it, it was such a big a big uh, growth period in motocross at that point and you'd had been just suddenly submerged with uh some of the biggest names till this day uh, you know when, when i looked at some of the research i was doing and and realized that it's 1974 and you're with you're with john r um, and, and next thing you know, you know, you're rubbing elbows with Marty Smith, who's a couple of years older than you at the time, and Pierre Karsmakers at Team Honda. It, it made me think for a moment if there was a, a moment in those early years where you saw a rider do something on the track uh, that, that changed how you looked at racing, made you a better rider, or gave you some confidence to try new things. Well, in just being around the best guys that... that absolutely makes you see what you have to do yeah you know? and whether it's the writing part the preparation part the training part the practicing the you know the intensity the focus all those things and and um you know so d- during the summer i got the you know when those guys that go testing you know i got uh, i got to come along some of the times and um you know and so you know you know in 73 you had uh um you know, Gary Chaplin and Marty Tripes and Gary Jones and Dwayne Jones and Richard Eierstedt, you know, and, um, and, and I tell you what, you know, in those guys, I was just, you know, the little kid, you know, that was there. And, and one thing that Dennis and, and John R and Roy, all three of them uh, helped me do too, was, is I was always pretty 
mechanically in, inclined anyway, but I would go in on the weekends or, you know, to the race shop at Honda and it wasn't like all secure like it is now. And, and I'd get the, you know, I'd put together part shelves and sweep the floor and, and I, you know, and, and they'd show me, they, you know, they all got their old tools, a bunch of old tools together and built me a little, you know, metric toolkit mm-hmm. and everything and, and showed me, you know, how do you, how do you, how do you know how tight to make the cylinder bolt when there's no such thing as a torque wrench that'll fit over a cylinder bolt, right? Yeah. This is how, this is how you feel it. This is the pattern you do. This is what you feel. This, you know, this is how you tighten. This is how you clean an air filter. This is how you don't clean up your tool. This is chain. This is adjustment. This is, you know, this is the timing. You know, this is the buzz box for timing. You know, for points on my SL125. You know, I mean, you know, by the, and then you know when at that same time, you know, when I started high school, I took industrial arts classes as much as I they would give me, yeah. and that's where I learned to, you know, roll pipes and and weld and you know arc weld, heli arc weld, mig tick, and you know uh, lathe and and end mills, everything. But we had a great machine shop, and Ed Dembo was the, the the shop teacher, and man, I learned everything. And then you know once I got my driver's license, then I would just go to FMF and pick up, you know, a bunch of cones and, um, and, and then take them home and use my bike for a jig and make, make pipes. And then pretty soon I start taking, uh, you know, uh, pipes and cutting up, making all the cuts myself, you know, and making, you know, the, the shake pipes. And, and I used to paint my own helmets and do, you know, that kind of stuff. And I, and I look back and I think, you know, uh, I, I look at, uh, how well Troy Lee's done, you know, with painting helmets and, and stuff like that. And yeah. FMF does with making pipes. And I'm thinking maybe I shouldn't have been a writer. Well, <laughs> so. <laughs> where we, we all wind up where we wind up for whatever reason, you know, Warren. Yeah. And, and, uh, we, we're, we're just grateful that, uh, that we've done some of the things that we have. So now let me ask you this, Donnie Emler's paying you to weld those pipes in your garage. What kind of corn are you pulling down in 1976? I, 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 and my memory is getting a little fuzzy on that. Well, actually, it was starting in 74 is when I started welding pipes. By the time 76 came around, I was only making my own pipes. I oh, okay. I wouldn't for anybody else. But 74, I'd make them. Yeah, and they were only for Cigar 125s because that was the only jig I had was my bike. Uh-huh. So yeah, I'd use my bike for the jig. And well, um, and then the, the, the flipper cone pipe was uh, the, on the Warren Reed kit for 75 and 76. That was, uh, that was a... a Myself and Emler and John are kind of, you know, working on taking instead of the boost ported 73, 74 cylinder, taking the 75 cylinder and doing a little bit of modification to the head and the, and the base of the cylinder and then uh, a special port job and a special pipe. And I made that first pipe um, that was on that bike, hmm. you know, and that, that became the WR kit pipe. So very interesting. Now, talking about 1976. That was the year you raced nationals. I think it's perhaps the deepest field of talent ever in the 125 class. You had legendary names such as Marty Smith, Bob Hanna, Danny Laporte, Steve Wise, Glover. I mean, you finished yeah. sixth. You finished sixth overall that year uh, against those guys. What would you say the the level of intensity was like throughout the pits and the traveling, and how did you prepare to compete uh, with, with that yeah. with that level of competition? That was uh, that was a really really tough year and um the you know and two guys that were in that started this series but had uh, health issues was billy grassi and danny turner you know so that tells you how deep the 125 nationals were in 76 that was the deepest field in the history of any nationals anywhere i agree and, and um and and i you know the uh i drove to all the nationals in 76 i didn't fly to anything and and um the, uh, the, the hard part was, uh, for me, that was the year I graduated, and it was also John R. went to Europe for Marty's world championship efforts, and then Dave Arnold was Marty's mechanic here in the States. And so, you know, my, my, my brain uh, trust for, you know, <laughs> sure. was, was in Europe. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, you know, John R. and I were, were close and everything, and, and, you know, luckily my mom you know, knew about travel and how to handle things and everything and, and kept me kind of organized on that end. But, you know, trying to, you know, go through all the, you know, graduation and, you know, making sure you had everything to get graduated and prep to go on the nationals and, um, and train and, and get all my bikes done. And, you know, FMF supplied all my, my stuff. So I had no worries there. And I had 
some, some you know, uh, Don Emler at all the races to, to take care of the bike. Uh, but during the week, I did, you know, drove to all the nationals and did all the rebuilds myself, you know, between between races, you know. Yeah. And, uh, yeah but that was from what Dennis Blanton and Roy and, and John R., you know, taught me over the years. I had no trouble, you know, ripping the thing down to the frame and then putting it all back. And, um, you know, and that, that was uh, – I, that was pretty proud for me too, because you know my, my my real father Bud Reed, you know, and I were still close through all this. And when I got one break in the national in '76, I got to go see him in Florida, and it was the first time he'd ever seen me uh, um, start ripping motorcycles apart down to nothing and putting them back together. And you know, I was 17 years old, and 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 uh, you know he and my dad worked big construction projects, you know, missile silos and and military bases and car factories and, and giant hospitals i mean he would be project manager on stuff like that so you know i always had a, a building you know kind of you know natural but it was i think it made him proud to kind of see, you know see me doing all that stuff and and he'd he'd had ideas that i was going to follow him into the construction trades i think and then and then i, I remember that trip and he asked me he said so are you thinking about college i go uh, no mm. <laughs> i'm not i'm gonna race motorcycles Okay, <laughs> and that's that's the way it went. And it's it's such an interesting story too, Warren, because well, I, I really hate to compare it to today because it's a completely different thing. But even back uh, in the seventies or whatever, when when a lot of riders uh, did get a, a break and did race professionally, they had a wrench. You know, they they had they had their mechanic there at the track with them, and a lot of them didn't do that. They knew how to give the feedback to make the bike work better but they weren't exactly hands-on guys, and it was understandable. And there you are, probably one of the youngest guys there who was able to do so much to maintain his own bike. It, 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 it helped, and, you know, and I was a, a fabricator at heart. When I, was, when I was 15, I made a... Remember Yamaha had those twin shock uh, bicycles? Yeah, sure. They, okay, well, I, my brother had one, and I, I took that and made it into a, a monoshock. <laughs> but, you know, I made a, you know, the, the, the rear triangle and put the shock underneath the, the top tube and, and made a monoshock bicycle in, in 74 when I was 15 in my garage. Wow. <laughs> you know, I wish I had that. I should have patented that when I look at all the, all the mountain bikes now with the shock, you know, underneath the top tube and everything. Yeah. I know exactly what you're referring to. Sure. The yeah. mode, it's called the, uh, the moto bike. Yeah. But anyway, now it's, yeah. it's, it's funny that you bring up the suspension part of this and, and the bicycle thing. Um, you know, with your career being so active during the suspension revolution and the fact that you were at FMF when things were changing so rapidly, what were some memorable moments as you watched forks get longer and shocks get moved up and laid down? What, you know, what do you remember about, about those years? But the, there was a lot of stuff going on. I do, I do remember that. And one advantage that I think I had over lots of people was uh, just because FMF and, you know, and my relationship with, with Don Emler and FMF was, was close, but also because of my closeness with John R and, and the, the team Honda guys, one thing that I did get was nobody went off in a stupid direction mm -hmm. or, and, and, and I, and I was kind of kept in check. Well, no, that's probably not a good idea. Don't do that. That. <laughs> Oh, yeah, or you'd see some new, you know, somebody have some new design or something at the races. And, you know, when you listen to the smartest guys on the planet with motorcycles talk about yeah, what, what's going to work or what's not going to work. And, and just they just had a, a better understanding and feel for what kind of engine tuning really worked and w which, you know, what wouldn't blow up or, you know, and what um, and what would run and what would handle good and what wouldn't. And um that, you know, too much travel on one side didn't, you know, he couldn't do too much. And, and so that, that one thing that, that, uh, my bikes were really fast and they were really reliable and they weren't radically trick, mm -hmm. but the piston clearance and the ring and gap and the cylinder wear and, you know, the, the, the you know the the you know crank bearings and rod bearings and clutch every all that stuff was you know what I was taught you you keep that stuff working perfect you know you don't have slop in, in the in the swing arm pivot you mm -hmm. know pushing and and uh, you know the shock the 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 
the bushings and the shock, you know, and, and arm joints and all those things and how to check them and look at them and, you know, and, and chain. And, and one thing that, that, that I think really helped me in those first couple of years, you know, privateering on the nationals in 125 was I, I ran lightweight tubes. I ran fairly small tire in the back. I didn't, I didn't buy into that. Well, the hard track is hard and slick. So you want a big giant tire, right? No, those things weighed a ton. Yes. I ran, I ran 428 chain and, and I ran aluminum rear sprocket. And, uh, so the, my, the unsprung weight and the amount of, um, the mass that the engine had to spin for a 125 was way less than a lot of the guys I was racing against. And I, and I firmly believe that that was a big part of what made my bike fast, but that was from the, the practical sense that, that I was kind of immersed in, you know, between, even, even though you think of Honda and all this radically trick stuff and FMF and, and how, you know, radically trick all that stuff was, but really those guys, I mean, they, they Radical trick if it's breaking all the time is is radically stupid. Yeah, <laughs> and, those, and, and those and those guys were not radically stupid. So uh, I I benefited from that, you know, seeing that and being around that. So. Yeah, well, all your all your efforts paid off from out from from those years. That's for sure because in uh, between seventy seven and seventy nine, you had a full factory ride from Honda. Um, you won the support class uh, in seventy eight for the Trans Am. What were some of the highlights of that of those years between seventy seven and seventy nine? Of course, I would think a highlight would be now that I'm reading my own question uh, would would be of course winning the support class at the uh, at the Trans Am. But what were some other things that happened during that era? Well, the in uh, in seventy eight also um, won the one twenty five national in Rhode Island with a twenty three inch front wheel that was on the works in seventy eight. The works bikes had the twenty three inch front wheel, and in seventy nine. The production bikes did, but 78, um, we ran the 23 inch front wheel and, you know, a lot of, I, I, that was worked good. I liked it, you know, okay. it, 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 a lot of people hated it. A lot of, I mean, the magazines just, just, you know, ripped it apart and that kind of set the tone that it almost, it was almost unrecoverable from that at that point and they had to change, but I still think it worked fine. I won a national with it. It was a sand track. I think that, you know, sand hoops, especially it was beneficial. Anything with, with big, deep ruts, it would be way better. You know, a lot of these, uh, all the supercross tracks with the big, you know, hoops and stuff, a 23 inch wheel would work. Yeah. The problem that that thing had was the tire selection was terrible. So, it, you know, you, you really were compromised on a, a a tire that worked good because there wasn't much to choose from for the different uh, track conditions. Uh, but it, it was short lived. I, I still think somebody should try it in Supercross and see how much better it works going through the hoops. There'd be a lot less guys going over the bars um, if they had a 23 inch front wheel than those you know, those 21s. So, yeah. Very, um, uh, very... That, that was a highlight. Um, the, the works bike. In, in Steve Wise and I both raced the first ProLink prototype at the 79 Trans Am, the international class. And uh, by the end of 79, Steve and I were the, had kind of moved to the top echelon of, the, of Honda mm -hmm. for the, the team. And um, so we got the two, they were uh, 380s. They were uh, not 400s or 450s or 500s. They were 380s. And they really weren't that fast, but the, gosh, they had great power. I mean, it, it was so so smooth and so tractable, but they had a, a linkage um, on either side, right above on the top of the swing arm. Yes, it worked worked the same as the single one did. It just it was with twin shocks, so that was the first time. And and I was just kind of coming into my own on open bikes, and uh, had having been a one twenty five specialist and, and a little bit of two fifty for a couple of years. Um, so that, you know, that, that, that bike was pretty good. I felt, you know, I, I was the fastest guy at the last Trans Am at Sears Point and just had the, uh, the worst luck on the planet, you know, and, uh, I think I came from last to fifth or something, the first moto and the, and the second moto, I, I went from mid pack to third and then I was right behind Moats and Mike Bell and, um, reeling them and I got an, a, a blowout. I had actually had a tire blowout in the rear. They had some sharp edge bumps at Sears Point. I'd never had that happen before or since, but um, anyway. That, and then the next week after that was Anaheim Supercross, and then a few weeks later was the Superbikers. But uh, the the 79 
Supercross series. I'm I'm very proud. Now that I, I work for Honda 30 years this coming June, I'll be 30 years as an employee at Honda. But and my 79 Supercross bike was was the pre-production bike of the first product Honda ever made in the United States, and that was the 1980 CR250. And that they, was made in Ohio. Yeah. So that 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 was my super. The pre-production bike was my Supercross bike in '79. So. Did you enjoy riding Supercross, Warren? I enjoy. Yeah, I, I enjoyed it a lot. At, at first, I kind of poo-pooed at the beginning, and then I, you know, started doing. It. Well, remember, I grew up in night racing in Southern California. You know, so, you know, yeah. Irwindale, Ascot, you know, Orange County, everywhere. And so, you know, Mike, Mike Bell, and I, you know, you, you think they go out in Supercross? Now you should have seen us at local races. <laughs> <laughs> Just, anyway, it's uh we didn't kill each other. We took each other out, but we didn't kill each other. Now, right. You know, some of the stuff nowadays is a little radical, but anyway. Um, but, the, you know, but again, all that prepared us, uh, you know, for Supercross racing. The intensity of Southern California was like nowhere else uh, in the world. And, and all the little, you know, motocross gangs, I'll call them, you know, you had the El Cajon gang and the San Diego gang and the, you know, the, the Escondido and, you know, North County, and then you had South Orange County, and you had Orange County, and L.A., and, you know, the San Fernando Valley, all the Valley boys that rode Indian Dunes. Sure. And then you had the, you know, all the Inland Empire guys like Rex Staten and, you know, and Bauer and, and uh, Tim Hoover and a bunch of guys. You know, there was, uh, there was all, you know, fast guys from all over. And, and, and whenever there'd be a big purse race, everybody'd show up at whoever's, you know, you know track had the big purse race. And, you know, the guys would go at it. it <laughs> It, it was good. It, it really made a difference. I think it it, um, it helped pro- propel Americans past the Europeans from '67 when it came to the U.S. Yes. By '81, we won the nations, and you know both the nations. In '82, we won two of the three world championships. You know, yes. You know, f- 15 years from nothing to domination. Yes. That is, yeah. Be- before we get it. Before we get on with a little more into the 1980s, in 1979, you entered the ABC Superbikers, and that was that was a new and novel idea. Only a few years had been uh, it had been out there. What was it like to be on Superbikers? And I think you were riding a Suzuki at that point. Oh no, Kawasaki. A Kawasaki. I, I, just, I, I, I signed with Kawasaki right at at the end of the '79 Trans Am, mm-hmm. you know, and, and left Honda. It was, you know. It, you know, that's that's a, a whole hour in itself, so we won't go in, into that. But I went to Kawasaki, and and, and um, so uh, anyway, got did my contract ending, you know, a month early with Honda, and then uh, raced the Kawasaki at, at Superbikers. And I'd never, you know, ridden on the pavement before, except my bicycle, mm-hmm. and, uh, or, or running from the cops if they <laughs> got, got, got me at a field riding my mini bike or something, but. Um, the, uh, you know, we, at, at Carlsbad Raceway, they had, you know, a, a small road race course and a drag strip and they just took and made some dirt track, uh, sections, you know, kind of hilly, more like scrambles, I guess. Yes. Know? And, um, and then, but, uh, some road race stuff and then, uh, it, and a little bit of Baja stuff because, you know, those guys go pretty fast on some of the pavement down there too. And then they put all the top guys from all the different disciplines together on one course and, uh. Um, and that, that brought me back with Roy Turner, you know, the, our old, uh, you know, cabin desert riding, uh, friend, you know, he, who worked from Honda, he had left to Kawasaki. And when Kawasaki brought me there, there was, uh, for Roy to be my, my mechanic. And, uh, you know, I, I'd had some good years at Honda, obviously, you know, obviously with John R and then, um, uh, Merle Anderson and I won the, the 250 Trans Am together. And then Brian Lunas, uh, you know, uh, John R. went with Marty Stripes in 79, and then Brian Lewis was my mechanic in 79. And, uh, and and he got me, you know, realized that I could beat all those other guys. You know, I wouldn't just, didn't have to just be a 125 guy. Let's, let's go after these other guys. Yeah. And, um, and then, uh, you know, anyway, with the super bikers, it was, I, I found out that I was comfortable going 120 miles an hour. I didn't know I was comfortable going 120 miles an hour. <laughs> Then, but I, I also remember that uh, that's years later when I look back at it that I that I had an anti lock front brake system because I was going into the, the corners um, on the asphalt 
and I and I had twin giant disc brakes on that thing, and I was pulling the front brake as hard as I could, and I'm I'm riding stoppies into the corners, going that thing, and uh, and and I and I realized it because the, the, the you know you're all of a sudden you your your wheel's not shattering anymore. It's not shattering because it's in the air. <laughs> oh, <laughs> the yeah. back wheel. So. Well, in, in uh, I guess by '82 you were you were riding for Suzuki, and you yeah, got a, you got a, yeah. You, Kawasaki and I had a uh, uh, an inamiable parting at the end of '81. Okay, or, or before the end of '81, that was a, a a sore subject. But you, um, I learned a lot about contract law. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> and and and, uh, and and what what parts of the contract have uh, you know are enforceable and which parts aren't and you know and, and and how to differentiate and you know those kinds of things yeah so um, anyway it, but you know what's funny is uh, when I wrote for Suzuki in 82 Kawasaki paid me more money than than uh, Suzuki did so oh and you still had money coming from Kawasaki at that time well yeah that was part of part of my see you guys later <laughs> ah. <laughs> so but i made more from kawasaki in 82 than I ever from suzuki at least salary was you know right basically. and and you had a really good year with with suzuki that one year too i mean a respectable fourth overall racing against donnie hansen ricky johnson brock glover um but yeah. it was there just not a good fit for you on that bike or why was it only a one-year deal i think it was a, it it um I don't, I think that they wanted me to, well, I wanted me to win the, the 250, just like Barnett won the 125, yeah. you know, and, uh, that was, um, it was tough, you know, and, uh, you know, uh, Brock and, and Ricky and, and Donnie and I, you know, went at it at various times in the 250 nationals, you know, and then in the supercross and, um, you know, there was, uh, at one point early in the season when, when Donnie and and Mark Barnett were dice. And remember, so Mark Barnett's my, my teammate now and Donnie Hansen's, you know, a real, real good friend. So my, you know, two of my, my, uh, my best friends from, you know, the factory days, you know, is, is uh, Steve yes. Wise and, and Donnie Hansen. And, um, you know, and still, you know, we re all remain to this day. Um, but the, they, the, there was a inferred that, um, if Barnett's behind me, you better let him buy. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I like Mark, but, um, you know, I, I wasn't going to over race him and I wasn't going to under race him, but I certainly wasn't going to let him buy. Sure. And, uh, it, it never really happened, but the conversation was so uncomfortable. It, it, you know, I, it, it felt like, you know, it, it was almost unredeemable. Or yeah. whatever. It, it was fine. We, we left. It wasn't, you know, we didn't leave bad. It didn't part bad, but I wasn't ready to quit. And, uh, and that's when, um, uh, Yamaha stepped up and, and gave me a uh, YZ490 and uh, to race for the um, Golden State Series and uh, and then I think I rode it for an hour on Thursday and I raced the first race on Sunday and then the next week I uh, won at uh, Lake Madeira and um, that was you know against a bunch of you know Honda Works bikes Magoo was there with his Works bikes and Go Brecker and you know, and uh, and I beat him on a box. I mean, box stock YZ four ninety hmm. box stock out of the crate. Nothing, not nothing. Nothing was changed on that bike. That's incredible. Now, you were ahead of the four stroke curve a little bit. Well, not a little bit. You were ahead of the four stroke curve by like fourteen years. <laughs> well, you you got a ride with ATK, and uh, you you went over to uh, I think you rode some GPs in Austria. Well, yeah, it, and even, you know, a little bit before that was uh, funny because the there was two guys that worked as service managers in some of the motorcycle shops. I told you I rode my Stingray to in okay. the early 70s, and that was Tom White and Dan White. Mm -hmm. And uh, they and they worked at um, Rustin's Yamaha, which, you know, if Rob Rustin, if you're out there, how you doing, buddy? But he, he lived, uh, their shop was around the corner from... Uh, where I lived, and then Orange Bob Maynard's Orange County Cycle. Bob Maynard, who was head of Thor, owned the uh, Orange County Cycle, and that's where Tom White and I knew Tom White from going that watching the half miles, you know, and, oh. uh, and I and I knew his brother Dan, and and we went, you know, back to when I was one of those kids on the Stingrays that would show up at the shop, you know, <laughs> and 
and and begging for a sponsorship <laughs> anyway and uh but years later we uh you know we we met up again and and uh, you know and we'd always kind of you know just kind of chatted and then uh they they had me race their bikes at some of the four stroke nationals and um uh, and so man i i love the you know those those 600s and 670s and and seven whatevers you know yeah uh, and okay, give me all, give me that horsepower baby let me go <laughs> I, I, I had a great time on them and i raced them you know uh at some of them and then uh in after you know i sat out most of 84 with a broken leg and that's when i started my cabinet uh, millwork contracting business with a good friend of mine randy skinner who's still in the the business um in fact uh, he he went to the same high school as, as my wife, Cinda, and that's in a roundabout way how we met. Mm-hmm. And, uh, the, uh, but, you know, he, he had his shop and I had mine and we were kind of working together. We were, you know, best friends. He went to a lot of the nationals with me in different races over the years and a good friend. We're still great friends and, and talk all the time. And, um, anyway, the, uh, you know, you know, I was doing that, but, you know, I, I wasn't making quite enough money in, in the cabinet business to make ends meet. So I do testing for horse and, and then I end up remodeling horse kitchen and, and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, anyway, and then, you know, what's, uh, so real. And then the 85, you know, I was working full time, but then still riding races here and there. And then that was, and that's when I started doing a little bit of speedway for the fun of it. And, um, so there one, uh, Friday night, I raced Speedway at Orange County, and I was only second division. I never did very good at Speedway. I was kind of a spaz at Speedway, but I had a good time and had fun, and, and I enjoyed all the guys that did it and still chat with some of them now and then. And, and those guys raced for decades, you know? Yes. But the uh, but anyway, the uh, I raced the Speedway on Friday night. Saturday night, I rode the Ascot Camel Pro Series Dirt Track National at, at you know, at Ascot, the TT. And then, uh, and then, uh, and that was on the White Brothers bike, and then, um, and you know, Dan and Tom, of course, they they grew up at Ascot, right? So they knew it well. And then I didn't make the main, but I made the program. And um, but we, my my brother and I, jumped in the, the van and we drove all night to Hangtown, and parked in front of the gate an hour before they opened the gate. And then I raced the Hangtown 500 National on Sunday. What? So you raced a Speedway on Friday, a TT on Saturday, and went to Hangtown on Sunday. Yeah, and then so the sat so I still have the pit passes for the Saturday night TT Camel Pro National, and the Sunday Motocross National in Hangtown, and then um, and then two weeks later I went to Austria and rode the 500 Grand Prix, and uh, anyway a, a, a funny story from the Austrian Grand Prix too. So two two funny stories from that that. So I, when I I had an in, infection in my thumb, but I got I got some metal shaving in my thumb from my shop before I went to Austria and I'm there and it's like three or four days before the race. And, you know, getting things ready. My thumb is swollen up and horse lighters running around Austria, you know, doing all the things he needs to do to get ready for the race and, you know, taking care of business. Cause he had a lot of suppliers cause he's from Austria for his ATK, a lot of parts made there. Yes. Anyway, so I'm, my thumb is starting to swell up and I, I go to the front desk and I, and, you know, I, 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 I thought by talking to the guy in a German accent, he could understand what I was saying. <laughs> You know, I, I copied the, all the old movies, right? And so I, I, I pointed my thumb. I said, infection. I had infection. And, <laughs> and, I, and he doctor. And he goes, and he, he points across the street. And it says, um, you know, it, it says, like, medical something, you know. So, I, so I, I go across the street, and I walk in. And just like every doctor's office on the planet, you know, and, and they got the little waiting room, and they got the fog window, you know. And I uh, and I tap the little thing and the window opens and this this fraulein lady uh, says and I, I did the same thing you know the the, the pictograph right you know or, or whatever and I, I pointed at my thumb and I said infection need a doctor and she goes one moment and then she and the doc she this lady doctor comes and, and you know she could tell her she's a doctor and she had the authority she I mean she was a doctor there's no doubt right. and she looks at me and I and I she goes can I help you and I said I have an infection I need a doctor. And she looks at me and she looks at all the ladies yeah. sitting in the waiting room behind me. And she says, this is gynecology office. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I turn around and, and I'm like, oh, crap. <laughs> well, I know where this thumb's going. <laughs> oh, oh, gosh. <laughs> and anyway, so uh, uh, obviously 
I found a doctor and got my thumb fixed and I rode to Grand Prix. You know, that was like with Thorpe and, and, uh, and, and Eric Gabors and, I mean, uh, you know, and, and, uh, Croc was all the guys. I mean, and that Sittendorf, Austria, you know, was, you know, you know, Brad real well. It's just, it's rocks and, and they have blue grooves on the rocks. Yeah. You know, these rock cliffs you got to go up. And, and, um, anyway, afterwards, a horse took me to uh, Vienna and, and, uh, and I bought a, uh, one of those little uh, leader hose and dresses, the smallest leader hose or dress in the off they have, because a couple of days before my wife, when I called home, she said, guess what? I'm pregnant, you know, for the what? third time. So I'm like, <laughs> cool. We had, we had two boys. We had Jared, you know, and Alden. And, and so we thought, Oh man, we got to have a girl. So I bought a little dress, right. To take home. And, and I, and um, so I get, uh, so we, uh, I, I get home and, and, uh, and then, uh, you know, Courtney's born and, and fast forward five years and I find the dress in a box and she'd already outgrown it couldn't fit it so. <laughs> that's incredible never, but it worked we had a little girl so. you did you yeah. did yeah and that so that was 85 and then uh and then in and that, that uh, June I raced the USGP at Carlsbad and I continued to ride you know some local races for horse just to do whenever they'd have a big four stroke race so I'd switch back to the Yamaha the, yeah, the White Brothers and then um I did, I did okay. I got 10th or 11th or something at the USGP on the ATK. And, um, and then that, and then BMW called in August and they, uh, wanted a rider for the Baja 1000. Yes. And so that's, um, so I, so I've been riding speedway, doing dirt track, doing motocross, been doing Grand Prix, doing, you know, playing around and doing all this stuff. And then, and now, you know, got a call to go ride Baja on a factory BMW. And I, and of course I knew Gaston Raye from the 125 Grand Prix when he would come over and, uh, and, and, you know, we got to know each other a little bit, you know, cause you know, he's a real talkative guy and I'm a real talkative guy. The two yes. of us, we, we, we pretty much talk up the room. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, uh, when he, he came over, him and Eddie Howe, Eddie Howe was a factory. He's done that guy back, back in the Andre Miller days. And, um, he was, um, uh, uh, uh so Gaston and Eddie Howe and Ken Park, who was a, a top desert racer, they were the, the over 30 guys. And then myself and Tom Kelly, who was one of the top desert racers, and, and, and Tom Kelly and I, we knew of each other, but we'd never met. And, and we're, we're like oldest friends now, you know, we're uh, very close. At, you know, we became very close during that race. But and our third guy on our team was um, Dave Chase, who a lot of factory Honda guys may remember was their engine builder during their their um 90s and 2000s he mm-hmm. was the engine builder but the three of us uh, i think that the uh the gaston eddie howe and ken park team got second overall the, the winner was uh uh derek payment and randy morales and uh, uh, uh randy morales rest in peace uh uh anyway the uh and, and derek payment uh asked me early on and and uh Derek, if you're out there, that'll never happen again. <laughs> <laughs> where, so, where, where, where did you guys finish in the Baja 1000, Warren? Oh, we got we got fourth overall. So, wow, and, and, oh, not bad for a street bike, huh? No, and I, I read somewhere where you said it was like one of the most incredible bikes you've ever ridden. That that bike was fantastic, and what was really good about it is before they had that uh, the anti torque system, you know. So, yeah. if you needed the rear end to get stiffer, you just grab more throttle, and it got really stiff with hmm. that drive shaft, and um, and, and I think I, you know, I did, I did a wheelie once. I, I put it in third gear and I was doing like 15 miles an hour and I, and I got a wheelie going and I, by the time I finished without shifting, I was doing 90. Wow. And, and I never shifted. And so, um, there are not that many motorcycles that'll do that. Probably some road race bikes, but that thing was like a thousand forty cc's. And, uh, you know, one of the big, uh, uh, problems with desert racing and, and anytime you're riding fire roads or things like that is when you cut to the inside of a fire road and the pucker bushes are growing out over the, over the dirt, you can't go way inside or the things just whack your knees. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, when you've got cylinders sticking out there, it obliterates, uh, pucker bushes. Uh-huh. And you have no, no worries whatsoever. You just take them out with the cylinders and, and, um, uh, anyway, we, we, we did on better, but the one, one of the problems with Baja is that, um, it's like super cross compared to Paris to Dakar because Baja is wide open brakes, wide, wide open brakes, wide open brakes. And those brakes were not used to, to that you know, kind of that, vigor that, that hard. Yeah. yeah. And, and then at, when I got on for the night section, um, the, uh, the, the braking was, uh, 
when I get on the brakes real hard, the, 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 the pads swole up. And so I, I, you know, I didn't know that, but I came into a pit and they gassed up and I went to take off and the pads had swollen. They were kind of grabby. And of course, they got hotter and hotter and hotter. And then it just locked up the front wheel. And I had only gotten maybe, you know, 300 yards from the pit. And I had to turn around and ride that thing back to the pit with a front, locked up front wheel. I, I I had heard that Al Baker was in a helicopter over that race and it clocked you at over 125 miles an hour on that bike. Yeah, on a dirt road. Yep. Yeah, that's, that's hauling ass. That sure is. It sure is. <laughs> it sure is. Well, and you know, you know the, 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 probably the gnarliest thing is that pre-running, I, you know, I'd, I'd only you know, played in Mexico a couple times, you know, never like no epic journeys in Baja, just playing around by the ocean and stuff. But um, we were pre-running down there, and um, I had gotten separated from the guys I was with, you know, pre-running, and uh, I didn't know it, but they had missed a turn, and I didn't. And I was just cruising, and I got ahead of them, thinking I'm still behind them. And they said, uh, you know, we're going to go to the next town, then we're going to get a hotel. At, you know, there's a hotel at the next town. And so I'm used to the, the American desert, you know. When, when you come to a town, it's obvious, you know, in the middle of the desert, it's, right. everything's pitch black, and all of a sudden there's lights. That, that's not like that in Mexico. <laughs> and so I keep following the little ribbons thinking, why aren't these guys waiting at these intersections? Why aren't they waiting? Well, there's the course there. Okay, I must have to just keep going. And and then uh, end up, anyway, I ended up spending the night in the desert. And, um, and uh, that was that was funny. I'm sure. <laughs> and, and let's, let's go back for a second. You know, in, in Supercross today, you'll see every guy go through the whoops and he's just skimming over the top of them. It's something that everybody does these days. But I read somewhere, or actually somebody kind of told me that, they said Warren Reed invented that move at Indian Dunes, skimming over well, the top of whoops. How true is that, that, Warren? That's the first place I tried it. I mean, lots of desert guys and lots of, you know, sand riders, you know, know that um, to go across, you know, round, soft hoops, um, you, you, your front wheel hits the top of the first one, and you keep on the gas, and you have your weight back, and you pull on the bars, and you'll go across the top you know mm -hmm. if you have stiff enough suspension most guys can't go through hoops fast because their suspension is too soft and it feels terrible everywhere else but that's how you go through hoops fast with the stiff suspension well you know the um you know I, i'd always yeah i used to go wide open testing for al baker out there in the, in the sand wash at indian dunes and then um at, at pittsburgh supercross they put a whole bunch in a row not maybe about a third the length that they have now, maybe half, but, you know, not quite as far. But but I just, I always had thought, you know, that, that I'd love to, to try that again, a section like that. And um, and so I just did it in practice. And I'm like, whoa, that worked. And it did. <laughs> but that's full, it's full commitment. I mean, the first time you try it, it is full commitment. And, uh, and I went, and I already had my Supercross bike set up really, really stiff because I learned that all those peaky jumps, the only way to make them fly level is if they're really stiff. That way you can hit the face of the jump really hard mm -hmm. and and not have the bike do stupid stuff. You know, if it's too soft, it just, you, you G out into the face of the, of the jump and then, you know, all these, you know, frame flex and everything just goes wacky and it's almost, you almost can't control the, the you know the shock and everything else and so it by making it stiff you can well that's also helps you to go across the tops of the bumps and and commit and so i and in the heat race at the pittsburgh supercross i beat uh jeff ward in one of the heats and i beat david bailey who won the supercross uh, championship that year in, in the semi mm -hmm. and then uh, and then i think brock won david got second i got third in the, in the main event but it was you know um it, it worked. And then at the Japan Supercross, they added a bunch of them, you know, and I, I made a bet to Ricky Johnson. I'll, I'll go wide open through those. And he said, you will not. I said, I will too. Watch. <laughs> so, yeah, they, well, they were, they were really soft. And so um, it just kind of just obliterated through it. And it, it um, after three laps, there's ruts everywhere. You couldn't do it. But anyway, it, he never paid up. He still owes me. <laughs> hey, hey, Warren, I, I want to ask you a little bit of a personal question now, and I, hopefully you can remember the answer. I'm sure you'll answer the question. We see what guys are making today between the, the factory ride and the sponsors and, and all the aftermarket things that go on uh, and how much they're paid. Financially, what was your best year racing that you remember? And how uh, much? I, I think probably, probably about 120000 from in, in everything. That's everything. Right. You know, not just salary, that's bonuses, that's 
you know, uh, endorsements. That's, you know, uh, overseas races that, you know, you try to get as much money back into the States as you can sure. <laughs> without, without the tax man finding it. And, uh, and anyway. that that was during your Honda years, or? Oh no, yeah, no Honda. You know, my, my highest salary at Honda was ten thousand oh, dollars a year. Okay, <laughs> it was very much. Well, you did you did mention Europe, so it must be around that eighty six yeah. era with the ATK and all the other racing you did at that well, time. But, well, no, I did. It was actually before because I didn't. You know, I was just, um, um, you know, I wasn't riding racing all the time for ATK. It was just kind of like on a per race basis. Mm-hmm. But you know, but I, you know, eighty. 81 to 81 and two were probably my biggest money makers. 83, uh, I did okay because, of, but that was all bonus and, and everything because I didn't get a salary from Yamaha. And, uh, but, um, you know, the, the, all the stuff I learned in fabrication, you know, and, and years and the only, um, uh, industrial art class I didn't take in high school was wood shop. And, you know, then I got my contractor's license in 85, I think, and, uh, 86. And then, I did a lot of race trucks. You know, I did, uh, you know, and a lot of the, I did the race shop at Pro Circuit. I did, uh, you know, Jeff Wartz, his old garage. He had his garage set up all pretty good. Yeah. But, you know, but mostly I did custom, custom cabinets and, you know, things like that. And, and but of course, the, all, everybody knew me from racing, so they wanted me to build a truck or a race shop or a, you know, this or that. So. Well, I mean, I, I was only asking about how much you made racing motorcycles, not not anything to do with your cabinet business. So I just wanted to make that clear. No, that's fine. Okay. But, hey, did you ever get an offer from a manufacturer and not take it, later regret it? Uh, yeah, in, in hindsight, I, I wished I wouldn't have left Honda. Mm-hmm. But um, the, um, because it, it, uh, they, they had had their heyday kind of in the mid seventies and it was kind of going away a little bit toward the end and it, it didn't seem like they were as interested in winning. Well, it obviously <laughs> that was a in, incorrect perception. So, um, because, you know, by, you know, 81, 82, 83, you know, uh, all, all through the eighties, you know, they, they just about dominated everything. So, yeah. 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 Now out of the box, I mean, with a lot, a lot of young guys back in those days, you know, we all drooled over works bikes and we thought they were the best thing in the world and they probably were. But I mean, I've spoken to Brad about it. I've spoken to Marty about it and so many other guys. Not everything is great right out of the box. So what was your least favorite factory bike and what was your most favorite factory bike? Well, well and you know, and toward, toward you, what you said, my, my, one of my, one of my quotes over time is uh, it, just because it's trick doesn't mean it's good. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, their stuff was, some of the stuff was really trick and, um, you know, the, uh, the 81 Kawasaki SR250 was really trick, you know, water cooled and disc brake and, and, um, you know, all, and 250s hadn't, you know, seen that. Um, but it, it really was hard to ride. I had a, I struggled a lot on right. that 81 bike. And, and it, it just, it just didn't, it, between the, the, the power and the, you know, it seemed top, you know, top heavy and twitchy, and um, you know, never could get the clutch to kind of engage just right, you know, for starts and things. You know, if your clutch didn't work perfect, it's it's hard. Roy was Turner was trying everything under the sun to get you know things working, and we just couldn't quite get it. And uh, you know, anyway, that that, that was uh, a lot of my frustrations yeah. <laughs> that and, year. And you would say the best bike out of the box was. Well, the, the um, I I loved the seventy seven RC one twenty five type mm-hmm. two, mm-hmm. and um, and then the eighty three OW two fifty Yamaha was pretty good too, and and um, you know and honestly the uh, the the four ninety that I rode in eighty three the Yamaha YZ four ninety yes. Actually, I detuned that. The only thing that bike had was a uh, an Olin shock, and I put a White Brothers ten millimeter reed spacer to tone it down a little bit, and that was that was the extent of what I did on that that bike. And you know, and and uh, you know, the, the BMW obviously was a, an amazing bike, and I did ride a lot of other really good bikes all during that time. And and one of the things that because I rode for the different companies and in just different circumstances, the way my racing career worked out over the time, 
And I, I had a lot of contact and work with a lot of great mechanics and a great and great um, just innovators in the sport. You know, Al, you know Al Baker and Don Emler. You know, and and, and, and guys, and of course all the you know look, look at all the mechanics. You know that uh, that it went on to, to lots of big things. You know, Roy Turner and Mike McAndrews and Paul Turner. You know, Paul Turner was Steve Wise's mechanic, and he started Rock Shocks. He used to stay at my house when he. Uh, would, would go into Honda to work, so mm-hmm. come to step down. But you know, you end up with all these these contacts, and and um, you know, and look at all the different kinds of racers, you know, and the, and some of the guys I got to know pretty good from racing. Some of the, the, the you know the desert guys and and the you know the speedway guys and the motocross guys and, and dirt track guys. Man, I, you know, I the I, you know I could go on for hours and hours and hours just on one little segment of any of that. Yeah, uh, with, with people that I've known and, and admired and things that they've done and, and, you know, good times we've had kind of shooting the breeze or, you know, or, or competing. Well, I, I've only got a couple of more things uh, to ask you, Warren. And I, I think they're going to be pretty interesting um, because then, you know, we're going to have to wrap up. We've probably gone over an hour already. Not that that really matters, but I know, I know you can go on and, uh, and talk about some things. You've got so many great stories. Now, if, if you could change anything in the sport of Supercross, probably Supercross more than Motocross, but let's include both of them. If you could change anything uh, in, those, in those two areas today, Supercross or Motocross, what, what would you do? If somebody said, you know, wave a magic wand, do whatever you like, what would you change? Well, I would, I would de-cookie cutter the tracks. They're all, they're all the same. In Supercross? And, well, Nationals now, too. Yeah. You know, and... Um, it's you know really high just high speed in, in the outdoors it's just high speed stuff I, you know i want to see a gnarly off camber you know i want to see an uphill that some guys can't make yeah you know if they if, if they make a mistake they don't make it you know and um you know i i i'd like to see jumps that are unjumpable where you're forced to do one jump at a time yeah. three times you know and um and you know, I, I'd like to see a per, you know completely flat corners. You know, I'm, you know, frankly, I'm getting tired of these bank corners in Supercross, where you know every pass is the guy jumps up the inside and stuffs the guy. Yes, I mean that you can see it coming from a you know a mile away, and it's frankly it's boring when you know, to. I, it, want, I want to see guys challenged. Yeah, you know? I I, I I agree. I think I think so many people would agree with that, um, and. Yeah, uh, we'd all we'd all like to see that. Now, I, I want to just get down to, you know, the social media. We've got Facebook, Instagram. We've got so many things. How does it make you feel when you see, you know, your career, your life uh, on social media? How it's all unfolded, and uh, to be such a part of of history of of the motocross movement. When when you look at that, I mean, not many people can go back and look at their careers, uh, maybe in sports, but. There's, there's really no place else where you could look back and, and see people talking about your life and putting up pictures like you do on Facebook and Instagram. How does it feel when you look at that to see your, you know, to see your whole life just unfold in front of you and having people talking about your career that's, uh, that spanned so long? But it, it, it feels pretty good. And one, one thing that is probably the biggest difference of the sport of motocross compared to any other, you know, world-class professional sport, and that's that um, most of those pictures are people that were fans. Yes. They, just, they, they took those pictures themselves and they kept them all these decades, you know? Yeah. And, um, and they, they kept them because that was a, a great, fun, incredible part of their life. And as it was, you know, whether we're, the factory guys were no different than everybody else. We loved the bikes. We were, you know, we loved to ride and, and, and get to race and, and no different than a guy that rode, you know, you know, intermediate every week at some, you know, track in the middle of nowhere. It's the same thrill, just, uh, you know, a higher level, <clears throat> but you know, all those pictures, um, that, that, that people did. And, um, you know, there was a, you know, a lot of the guys back then, I think we weren't so protected from the fans. Yes. And so we got to talk to them and meet them. And some guys, you know, we became friends with, or they'd invite you over for dinner, you know, at, at some house in Michigan or somewhere in Maine or, you know, whatever. And that's, that stuff was all really fun. And I um, enjoyed it. And, and that's, 
you know, kind of uh, what we're we're doing, and, and the the family aspect of the sport, I think, as much as anything, uh, you know, it was family riding for us. I think it was the same for you know Marty Smith and Tommy Croft and and so many guys. It was the family that went riding, and yeah. then and then and some of them kids were were, were pretty fast and told dad they wanted to race, you know, or mom or yeah, <laughs> and. Uh, and and that's and that's where it went, um, and, and so that's what it is. And, and you know, really, you know, for for me, it's it's a so many of my my family and cousins, you know, on all around were involved in motorcycles in some way, and or either they followed me or they ran on it themselves, and and we all can relate, and their friends and my friends, and 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 Facebook, you know, brings all that back and reminds us how much fun we had and, and, and kind of, I think gives us a better perspective on everything we're doing now. Yes. You know, yes, it make does. Sure, make sure it's fun. <laughs> yeah. Well, Warren, uh, I want to thank you for being my first guest here at Vintage Motocross Radio. We, uh, we covered a lot of ground, but I know there are so many other stories that you can share with us. I, I, we just didn't have time. I'm, I'm certain that you have a great <laughs> rental car story, um, and we'll get back to that uh, on a future episode. Will you come back again? Yeah, I'd love to. Look, look forward to hearing uh, some more of, uh, of my old buddies <laughs> telling some stories, too. So. I'll gather up the old crew and uh, we'll get some things done, okay? Good deal. Thank Warren, you very much, Joe. I had a great time. Thank you so much, okay. and we'll speak to you soon. All right. We'll Bye-bye. Thanks. Uh, bye-bye. Well, that wraps up our interview with Warren Reed. I hope you enjoyed some of the questions I had for him. I'm going to stay on here Uh, for just a minute longer and uh, I wanted to thank everyone for tuning in. Remember to tune in also to our Wednesday show Vintage Motocross Q&A that's uh, on Wednesdays at 6 o'clock and we'll be back next Sunday at 4 p.m. During the week I will announce who my next guest will be. Thank you all so much for joining me this afternoon. Have a great week.